that's four years old up through the sixth grade. And so I encourage you to make sure you get them here for that. Also, the women's Bible study has started, and it's not too late to be able to get in there and participate with them uh, on Wednesday nights as well. It's all at 6.30, and also the men's Bible study on Wednesday nights at 6.30. I encourage you to come, participate in those different ones, as well as on Sunday night we have Bible study. We are looking on Sunday night at the pursuit of holiness. If you want to participate and you have not got one of the books yet, there still are some books down front here. If you want to grab one of those to be able to participate in the Bible study on Sunday night, the pursuit of holiness. So I encourage you with those different Bible studies. And uh, I see that a lot of the ladies have made it back apparently. And uh, they are here from the ladies retreat. Uh, sometimes they don't get back till after we're about halfway through. Uh, but we're glad that they're here to participate with us uh, this morning and hope that y'all had a great time uh, there at the retreat. So I think that that's all in the way of announcements. So let's uh, begin our worship time together this morning. Let's stand together and begin our worship time together. Let's start with a word for it. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we quiet our hearts and we allow your Holy Spirit to challenge us in our thought life. Lord, I pray that you would guide our thoughts. I pray that you would be with those who are physically not able to be here, Lord. I pray that you would bring healing and strengthening to their bodies. For those who are hurting emotionally today, Father, may your Holy Spirit encourage them. May your word bring comfort and hope to their life. I pray that you would give me the words to say that would speak to our hearts. May your Holy Spirit use me to be able to speak to your people this morning. We thank you again for the privilege to this morning participate and once again think about your greatness and your glory and your majesty and to sing praises to you. Father, thank you for all that you have blessed us with. Bless our time together this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Lord, I lift your name on you.
bench with our speaker Sue Miller. It was Psalm 26. There's 11 verses to it, and it talks about how strong God is and how he helps us through, and he's always there to help us fight our battles and the love that he has for us through our, our hard times and the turmoils and the battles that are going on that we have in our lives. So just always remember the love that God has and how strong it is and how he's always there for you. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I want to remind us again that the only reason we're here is because of Jesus Christ. Amen. The only reason that we're here is because of his shed blood. Because he has paid for our sin. As we were studying in our studies through the adult Bible study this morning in the Gospel of John, we were at the crucifixion. And at that moment when he said, it is finished. At that moment when it is declared that payment for sin has been made in full. And that there's nothing that we can do to add to it or take away from it. And we are reminded that it's all about that Jesus Christ paid it all. And we owe everything to him. We're reminded of that in the wafer. That reminds us that it was his body that was beaten. It was his body that was beaten beyond recognition. Isaiah 52 reminds us that he was beyond recognition as a man. And yet he did it for us. Eat ye all of it. It also says that they took the cup. And he reminded them that this was a symbol. It reminds of the blood that he has shed for us. That he has given of himself. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And so he reminds us, as he reminds the disciples, do this, continue to do it, until I come again, drink ye all of it. We're going to stand together. You can just pass the cup to the outside of the aisle as they come and collect those. Let's stand together and sing, Oh, how he loves you and me.
Turn me in your Bibles to the book of Numbers in chapter 18. Numbers chapter 18. Continuing our series through the Old Testament, we last week introduced this topic of stay in your lane. We talked about it. I want to go back and just simply remind us again about staying in our lane. The fact that God has a race for each of us to run. My race is not your race. Your race is not my race. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, reminds us, it says, Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, those witnesses of the Old Testament, those witnesses that were faithful in chapter 11 of Hebrews, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. We have a race. You and I both have a race to run. And because of that, we're to do it with endurance. He says, looking at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In the midst of your race, there are times when we may want to quit. There's times if you're out there on the racetrack and you're running a race, there's times when maybe you may say, oh, I'm exhausted, I don't know if I can go any further. Might as well just quit. But there's something that drives, there's something that pushes, there's something that says, no, don't what? Don't quit, keep running. Well, for the Christian in our Christian life and the experiences of life that we face, when we see the obstacles, we look at Jesus. And we stay focused on Jesus because He's already run the race. He's already finished the course. And I can look at Him and know that I can make it too. That He has granted me the power to be able to live the way that he would desire for me to live and to finish the race. He says, do it so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. He assumes that it's natural for us to get weary and it's natural for us to question and say, hmm, maybe I should just quit. Remember, the book of Hebrews is written to a group of people who were struggling. A group of people who are wondering whether we should just go back to the old way. And the writer here says, no, don't quit. Keep focused on Jesus. He's reminding us what we learned last week. Don't get caught up with a self-exaltation like Korah did. Remember, Jude reminds us that that's what it was. Or of the others that forgot to just run their race and stay in their lane. You know, there were 250 others. There were also another 14,000 that didn't stay in their lane. And because of it, God had judged them. But God has gifted each one of us uniquely different on purpose. Did you know that? Aren't you glad that everybody isn't like you? Amen. I am so glad that everybody isn't like me. And I know you are so glad that everybody isn't like me. Okay? The reality is he has done it this way on purpose. And within the community of believers, God has gifted individuals so that we can work together, so that we can accomplish God's purpose in this place. So some of the verses to highlight from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First of all, starting in verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. It's for the good of everybody. Your gift that you have isn't just about you. It's about the good of all. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. You didn't sign up for it. God says... 
This is what I'm giving you. This is what my will is for you to have this gift. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. We are all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one part, but many. We're all part of the body of Christ. Even as the analogy of the human body. He says, but now God has arranged the parts, each one of them in the body, just as He desired. I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the parts of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. So that there may be no division in the body. Don't miss that. He has deliberately made it so that those that we think maybe aren't quite as necessary are very necessary so that there is no division in the body, but that the parts may have the same care for one another. <clears throat> you slam your little finger with a hammer, the rest of your body comes to what? <laughs> comes to care for it. Guaranteed. Why? Because it believes it's very important. And when one part of the body of Christ hurts, all of us ought to hurt together collectively. That we ought to care for one another rather than in arrogance saying, well, they had it coming to them. Be careful. Be careful. See, just like the Israelites, Paul had to remind the Christians at Corinth not to be jealous or envious of each other. Why is it that Paul had to remind them about these spiritual gifts. Why is it that Paul had to remind them, stay in your lane? Just like back in the book of Numbers. Even though it's thousands of years later, the same reminder was necessary for the people at Corinth, just like the people of Israel in the book of Numbers. When you go a little bit earlier in the book of 1 Corinthians, the reason Paul is giving what he is giving in verse chapter 10 and 11, and also there in chapter 12, is because 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, merely infants in Christ. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly, and you are, are you not acting like mere humans? See, when there is jealousy, when there is not staying in the lane, when there is envying and wanting what somebody else is able to do, or like Korah, wanted, wanting the position of Moses, and that we all have the ability to do that, no, we stay where God has put us, with a task that God has given us, and that's where we will find the greatest blessing. Envy and jealousy are characteristics of spiritually immature believers. Paul says, I couldn't speak to you as those who were mature. <clears throat> I had to speak to you as mere infants. They fail to stay in the lane that God has created for them, gifted them for, and they want to run someone else's race. But notice that that is a sign of spiritual immaturity. When you look at James chapter 3, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. You know, you can talk about, Boy, I've learned all this truth. I've gained all this knowledge. And man, I just, listen, wisdom itself is not enough if there is not love and compassion and understanding along with it. You have to have it together. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, 
peace-loving, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, free of hypocrisy, and the fruits of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So the longer I live the Christian life, the more I am gaining in my experience and knowledge of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he has done for me, I ought to be growing in mercy. I ought to be growing in grace. I ought to be growing in a desire to show gentleness and peaceableness to other individuals and seeking to create peace within the family of God. That doesn't mean that there's never any times where you have to take a stand and say, no, this is what the Word of God says. That's not what we're saying. But how do I do it? What's my attitude? Important to recognize that the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That brings us to where we are today. Today, we have three reminders given by God so we stay in our lane. So look at Numbers chapter 18 with me. And first, it gives us the duties given you by God is a privilege. The first reason I'm going to stay in my lane is because the duties that God has given me is a privilege that God has entrusted to me. And He has entrusted to you as well. It's easy to look at what everybody else is doing and say, I need to do this. I want to do this. I want to go that way. Rather than recognizing that what God has given you to do is a privilege for you to do it. Look at what it says beginning in verse 1. So the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's household with you shall bear the guilt in connection with the sanctuary. That's weighty. And you and your sons with you shall bear the guilt in connection with your priesthood. In other words, you're responsible. If the tabernacle is defiled, it's on you, Aaron and your sons. But bring with you also your brothers, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father. That's Korah's family, the one we talked about last week. See, Korah had a great responsibility. Korah had a great privilege of following after and being able to serve alongside his brothers those descendants of Aaron, his relatives, his cousins, says, while you and your sons are with you before the tent of the testimony, serve where God places you. Be content in that. Recognize that it's a privilege that God desires for you to serve in his ministry. Verse 3, it says, And they shall thus attend to your obligation and the obligation of all the tent. But they shall not come near to the furnishings of the sanctuary and the altar, or both they and you will die. In other words, they can't come in the inside part where you're going to have to carry out the ministry as the faithful priests, the descendants of Aaron. But there is so much that they have to take care of. All of the offerings that are coming, all of the tithes that are coming in, even this taking down and setting up of the tabernacle and all that goes with it, organizing the people coming in, there's no way that the sons of Aaron could do all of it. So God gave them the Levites to do it with them. Verse 4 says, They shall be joined with you and attend to the obligations of the tent of meeting. For all the service of the tent, but an outsider may not come near you. You have this special place. Look at what it says in verse 6 and 7. This is key to understanding this idea of privilege. He says, Behold, I myself have taken you, your fellow Levites, from among the sons of Israel. They are a gift to you. Korah had forgotten what a great privilege it was. He says, dedicated to the Lord to perform the service for the tent of meeting. But you and your sons with you shall attend to your priesthood for everything concerning the altar and inside the veil, and you are to perform service. I am giving you the priesthood as a bestowed service. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. What a privilege. What a privilege to be serving and caring for the place, the very place where God would come and make himself known to the rest of the world. 
to the children of Israel and ultimately to those who came in and participated. They couldn't go inside, but they could see the glory of the Lord. They could see and worship because of the fact that you have Aaron and the priesthood and the Levites taking care of all of that so that God was there in their midst present among them. What a privilege to be in charge of taking care of. It's a privilege to be able to serve God, for none of us are worthy in ourselves. They weren't worthy, and neither me nor you are worthy either. But God gives us that privilege to be able to do that. God gave the gift of himself to his ministers. This is an amazing portion here when he talks about the gifts that they would have. Flip over and look at chapter 18 and verse 19. All the offerings of the holy gifts which the sons of Israel offer to the Lord I have given to you and your sons and your daughters with you as a perpetual allotment. It is an everlasting covenant of salt before the Lord to you and your descendants with you. Then the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land nor own any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the sons of Israel. Wow. He says, I give myself. I am your gift, Aaron. I am your gift to you and the Levites ultimately. I am this gift, the greatest of all the gifts. In fact, God's arrangement with the priests and the Levites was such that they would continually be reminded of this. They were not to receive an inheritance or any portion of the land of Canaan because their special portion was God himself. Everything they relied on was for the worship that came to God, then gave them their portion. God says, I am your portion. I am the one who is going to take care of you. I am the one who is going to make sure that you always are taken care of. The people's immediate dependence for provision was on the soil that God would bless. God had told them, if you'll obey me, if you follow me, love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your heart. Okay, And he reminded them, if you do this, then you'll never have to worry about your crops. The former rain, the latter rain will always come at the right time. The sun's going to shine at the right time. Your crops are going to be abundant and overflowing. He says, test me and see if I won't give it to you that way. Their blessing came based on what they put in the ground. God would bless the priest and the Levites' immediate dependence was on the effective functioning of worship in God's sanctuary. For if there were no worshipers, there would be no gifts or tithes. So it was absolutely critical that worship would take place. Because when people came to worship, that's when they would receive of the gifts and the tithes that God had for them. And God says, I will constantly remind the people. I'll constantly bring it before them that they will know that as they worship, that ultimately then the tithe for the sons of Israel, which they offer as an offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Korah had forgot how great a privilege he had. And it's easy for us sometimes to look at everything and everybody else and become envy and, and have envy and jealousy in our heart because somebody else has something and we don't have it. Rather than simply running the race that God has set for us. Recognizing that it's a privileged position to be in. We'll talk about some of the privilege in just a moment. Let me state it another way. The worship of God is infinitely more delightful, more rewarding, and far more productive than the cultivation of any soil. When you have opportunity to serve God and worship Him and participate in that worship, it is far more rewarding than anything this world can produce. The priests and the Levites were assigned places to live in Israel 
but they did not have property for which they could have income. They had to trust God to meet their needs. But when God is your inheritance, what more do you need? Do you believe that God is your inheritance? Do you believe that Jesus Christ has promised you, I go to prepare a place for you? If you believe that, then we ought to live that way. Colossians reminds us in chapter 3 that we need to make sure that our focus is on heaven and don't get all caught up with today. Remember that we ought to constantly be focused on our eternal home, our eternal dwelling. I've, had, I've heard people say, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Baloney. I want to tell you something. If your focus is on heaven, you will be every earthly good. Because you'll be doing whatever God desires for you to do to minister, to serve, to reach people within the lane that God has put you. Because your passion and your desire will be to communicate God's grace to a world that needs to know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. It behooves me to, to think that we can go through our whole Christian experience and never once share the gospel with somebody. Never once give the good news that Jesus Christ is the answer for the struggles of life that we're facing today. Jesus is still the answer. He has always been the answer. He came into a world that would not even acknowledge Him. But He came into a world at a moment when failure for Him to come at that moment. Galatians reminds us in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman made under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. I had a professor who used to say, you could translate that, in the nick of time, God sent forth His Son. Why? Because the world was that bad. We think it's bad today? It was even worse then. Oh, we're fast trying to move towards that. Because whenever you leave God out of the picture, then ultimately, He gives them over in the wickedness of their heart to their own passions, which ultimately in itself becomes a consequence and a judgment from God. But when God is your inheritance, what more do you need? Psalm 16 reminds us, you will make known to me the path of life and your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Do you know the fullness of joy that can only come because you have recognized the path of life, you have recognized the lane that God wants you to run in, and because of it, you're following that? When you do, there is fullness of joy. You say, well, Pastor, you don't understand my circumstances. You don't know what's going on in my life right now. Jesus does. Jesus does. And we're reminded in Hebrews chapter 4 that He was tested in every point like we are yet without sin. He knows what it's like to be where you are. He knows what rejection is like. He knows what pain is like. He knows what those who are of His own family rejecting Him is like. He understands all of that. And that's why He's able to come along beside and to comfort and to aid in the midst of our sorrow, in the midst of our suffering. But He has something so much greater waiting for us. He has something so much far beyond anything this world has to offer. You can have it all. You can have that $20 million house. Still is not going to compare to what the Lord has waiting for us, for those who love Him, to those who are called according to His purpose. You have made known to me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. Jesus says in John chapter 15, I have come that you might have life, that you might have it to the full. John chapter 10, John chapter 15, abide in me, He says. He wants us to know that there we can have fullness of joy. And there we can produce much fruit. 
By the way, you are rich. You say, man, I wish I had what everybody else had. No, you don't. You've got so much beyond that. We are reminded in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 that though he was rich, yet he became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. Jesus Christ left the throne of heaven and the glory of heaven, glory that's beyond our comprehension. When Isaiah got just a glimpse of it, he fell on his face as a dead man. And here, Jesus left all of that to come to walk among people who hated him, crucified him, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. That's rich beyond comparison. There is nothing this world has to offer that can match that. You're an heir with Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 17 reminds us. Think of what he owns. <laughs> everything. He owns everything. You know, we sing a song, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. Uh, he owns everything. Everything is his. He gives it to us on a stewardship trust to use it wisely for his glory. But it's all his. And we're an heir with Christ. You're gifted to serve. He looked at you, and you may look at yourself and say, I can't do anything. I'm nobody. I don't have any talents. And God says, I've already gifted you to serve me. And you can serve me and be faithful to me, and you can have reward based on not how great you are, but on faithfulness. He rewards based on, am I faithful with what God has given me? I've used this illustration before, but I tell you, I grew up in a church where on any Sunday morning there could be between 80 and 100 mentally handicapped adults. That some of them can't, couldn't even tie their shoes. Some of them uh, could read a little bit. Some of them could read and then close the Bible up and recite back everything they read. And you shake your head and say, who here really has a problem? <laughs> okay. But in reality, they couldn't turn around and tie their own shoes or dress themselves. But they were faithful in sharing Jesus with anybody who came in their path. All you had to do was say, Ricky, I don't think this person knows about Jesus. And he was on you to be able to share with you, you had better know Jesus, because if you don't know Jesus, you're going down there. And I, you're going down there. <laughs> and you'd be like, whew, okay? And we don't have the boldness to even do that kind of thing. But you have to wonder, What's his reward going to be in heaven? Amen. When he has clarity of mind, perfectness, and God gives him reward because he stayed in his lane and didn't complain about it. You're gifted to serve. You have direct access to God. You have the ability to come directly to the throne of God because of Jesus Christ interceding for you. You can talk with God at a level that Moses talked with God, and yet the rest of the children of Israel only long to be able to do that, and yet we can because of Jesus Christ. You have an eternal body waiting for you. Who what a joy that will be. <laughs> that will be a joy when we have that eternal body that is totally free from pain and suffering and everything that we look at in this world and say, oh, but serve God. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Keep your eye on him. You have an eternal body waiting for you. And you have a reward for your service. We'll all stand before the Bema seat. Some translations say judgment seat. It's that place where you get the reward 
for running the race. If you ran according to the rules and you finished the race and you won, then you get a reward for it. God gives that based on faithfulness. Stay in your lane and enjoy your privilege to serve. Stay in your lane and enjoy your privilege to serve. Look at chapter 19. Chapter 19 gives us another reminder as to why we should stay in our lane. The reminder is there is a distinctive sacrifice that reminds us it's all about holiness. God is holy. He desires for us to be holy. He's made it possible for us to be holy. He had made it possible for the children of Israel to be holy. It was the only sacrifice that offered a heifer. It was burned with hyssop, or cedar, hyssop, and scarlet wool. It was burned outside the camp, and its ashes then were preserved in a stone jar after the sacrifice was burned. Look at chapter 19. Beginning in verse 2, this is a statute of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, that they may bring you an unblemished red heifer, in which there is no defect, and on which a yoke has never been placed. You shall give it to Eleazar, the priest, and it shall be brought outside the camp, and be slaughtered in his presence. This is the only time you see this happening. It had a unique, distinctive sacrifice. It was a -a one-of-a-kind sacrifice. A red heifer without blemish, without spot. It couldn't even have a colored... You know, sometimes you have horses that have to meet certain criteria, and if they have any little blemish outside of that, then they can't be registered. Okay? This heifer could not have any discoloration whatsoever in its coat. It had to be exactly perfect. And then this sacrifice was made, and this sacrifice actually served as purification of sin. Look at what it says down in in verse 11. It says, The one who touches the corpse for any person shall be unclean for seven days. That one shall purify himself from uncleanness, with the water on the third day and on the seventh day, and then he shall be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day and the seventh day, he shall not be clean. The word purify there is literally, in the Hebrew, de-sin or unsin oneself. It is the idea of holiness, separate from. That if you do this, it is the water of Purification. Look at verse 9, the end of the verse. The sons of Israel shall keep it as water to remove impurity. It is purification from sin. The idea was that they would mix these ashes, this sacrifice, with the water. And I don't know what the significance is other than the sacrifice itself. Because... If you just simply have, if you were just to burn some ashes of an animal and mix it with some water, what's that going to do for an individual who touches a dead corpse? But because this is what God has said to do, therefore, it would make it so the individual would be pure. The individual would be holy. The cleansing from defilement was always available. See, that's moving us into the line where now we understand there's a significance here that is beyond just simply this ritual that was taking place there in Israel. The ritual pictured the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. The fact that in Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1.19, in Jesus Christ, it is with not with silver and gold, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Here's the connection in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 
See, what they were doing in the Old Testament, don't miss this, because what they were doing was pointing forward to and was a type of, it was typology that was pointing to Jesus Christ. Important to recognize that because we're going to see why it is so important to follow it exactly the way God says in just a moment in our next reason to stay in our lane. We're reminded in 1 John, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. That's why it is such an affront against a holy God if we try to come on our own terms. If we try to come any other way in our own works, on our own righteousness, it cannot be because it, is, has, it has to come through Jesus Christ alone. God was concerned with the Israelites' purity and holiness. And God is concerned the same way for us. He is concerned for us in the same way that we would be a pure, holy people. Just highlight Titus 2, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Look at Ephesians 1.4, that he would be holy and blameless before him. Colossians 1.22, that we would present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. The idea is that God desires for us to be holy. He desires for us to be without reproach. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 24, Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. You get the idea? It doesn't matter whether it's Israel or whether it's us. God has prescribed a way whereby you could be holy and blameless before him. If you tried to do it on your own, or you said, I... I don't buy that. I don't think that's the way I want to do it. Then in the life of the Israelite, you'd be cut off. For us, we can try to do it our own way. We can try to say, I can be holy myself without Jesus. You try that, and you'll spend forever in your own holiness, apart from God, with the devil the one who said that he was going to be like the Most High God. A one-of-a-kind sacrifice that reminds us it's all about holiness. I think sometimes we've missed that as Christians today. We know that it is something that we have positionally. In our position, we are pure and holy because of Jesus Christ. But we also know, as we're learning on Sunday night, that it is something that you pursue practically in your everyday life. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Stay in your lane and be holy. <laughs> Just stay and do what God has asked. Don't try to negotiate it. Don't try to do it some other way. Just do what He has said. Third reminder comes in that there may be disqualification for not staying in your lane. So quickly, look at chapter 20 with me. In chapter 20, the sons of Israel... The whole congregation came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month. Let me just help you to set the stage for this. This was the first month of the 40th year after their departure from Egypt. They are nearing the end of their journeying. The older generation, those who were 20 years old and older, virtually all of them have already deceased, the majority of them. You've got this younger generation that has come along now, and they have been traveling in the wilderness now for 38 years. The majority of them, though some of them have been born while in the wilderness. But we learn from Deuteronomy chapter 1 that it was 38 years from the going out of the spies. From the time that they had rebelled at Kadesh Barnea, now it's been 38 years they're getting ready to go into the promised land. But guess where they are? Notice, 
here, it reminds us in verse 20, chapter 1, chapter 20, verse 1, now they're at Kadesh. Interesting. After 38 years of walking around the wilderness, God has brought them back to where they first rebelled. Moses is around 120 years old. Miriam is around 130. She's going to die right here. Okay? A new generation is almost ready to enter the Canaan land. The old generation has almost died out. They have come full circle and are back at the place where they left the will of God. Where you leave the will of God will be the place where you get back on track. When you turn your back and you walk away, the place to come back to is where you left from. I haven't been following God. I haven't been walking with God. I, I've been seeking my own way. I haven't been spending time in His Word. I haven't been spending time with His people. I haven't. See, you come back to that place and get back on track. If you get out of the will of God, stop doing things like tithing, praying, church attendance, refusal to be baptized, or reading the Word, then the area of neglect is a place where you must obey to be what God wants you to be and do His will. Come back there. Start there again. Go. They recognize where they are. There is a big need. Look at verse 2. There was no water for the congregation. This is a big problem. You've got a couple million people, and you don't have water. That's an issue. The need was real, but the response that Israel gave was filled with unbelief and bad attitude which always go together. When you have unbelief that God is for you and not against you, when you are not faithful to God and following after Him, when that is the case, you can be sure there is going to be bad attitude also. They always go together. When you find a bad attitude, you also find a lack of simple, secure trust in God. Notice what it says here, verse 2. There was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. The people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why then have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us into this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there water to drink. Sound familiar? Sounds like mommy and daddy, grandma and grandpa, saying the same thing back in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 2. Rather than recognizing, trust God. He's kept us these 38 years. Our shoes haven't worn out. We may not have always thought the food was the best, but He's always what? He's always provided for our needs. When there wasn't water, He has given us water. So because of that, why is it that they had the real need but the wrong response? They were focused in the wrong place. Their focus was not on God. What about asking God? What about crying out to God and saying, God, I know you know that we need water. We need you now to give us water like you have in the past. But no, they start complaining. You ever been there? You've seen God meet your needs in the past. You've seen God do amazing things in the past. But right now today, you forget. And you say, why me? And you start the whining. They are perpetual whiners, aren't they? They're whining. I mean, look at, mine's well have died like Korah and, our, and the friends in the wilderness. What are you talking about? You've got everything to live for. You've got everything ahead of you. Maybe today you say, what's the use? Why not just give up and quit and die? Because God has a purpose for you. God desires for you to trust Him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't rationalize yourself into despair. Trust Him. 
He's bigger than the issues of life that you face. Sounds just like their parents. What was Moses' response? <clears throat> Moses and Aaron fell on their face. They recognized when under attack, go to meet with God. When you're under attack, spend more time with God. Not less time. Don't say, God's not in this, so I've got to handle this myself. No, when you're under attack, spend more time with God. When unsure what to do, go to meet with God. That's what they do. Notice, they're unsure. They fell on their face in verse 6. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. The glory of the Lord appeared to them. God promises that if you seek me, you will find me. God promises, seek after me with your whole heart. In the worst moments of my life, the greatest truth I have learned is that when I fall on my knees before a holy God, He desires to come and meet with me. And if the children of Israel would have done this, He would have met with them too. And they would have seen the glory of the Lord. But Moses and Aaron are able to speak with the Lord. And then God speaks to Moses. He says, take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the, ro speak to the rock before their eyes. Back in Exodus chapter 17, when an event like this happened before, we know that God told Moses to strike the rock. Here, he tells Moses, speak to the rock, that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and let the congregation and their beasts drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded him. He's to take the rod because the rod is the symbol. The rod is the symbol that God is with me, that God has empowered me, that I am God's messenger, that I am God's spokesperson. That's what the rod symbolized for him. But notice what Moses does. Moses' attitude, Moses is told to speak to the rock. Look at his attitude, verse 9. It can happen with leadership as well as anyone. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and said to them, you got to hear this, right? You can, hear the, you can hear the angst in his voice. Listen, you bunch of rebels! What do you think? I'm going to speak to this rock and water's going to come out of it or what? I mean, that's kind of the idea that he approaches it with. He says, listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? I've had about enough of this complaining of you. And so what does he do? In that moment, he takes it and he hits the rock twice. God in his mercy still sends water. But God says to Moses, whoa, 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 whoa. You have just exalted yourself and not me. You have just now made it so that I am not holy before this people. Look at what the text says. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me, to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. What was the issue here? The issue was failure to believe. The issue was failure to treat God as holy before the people, and the people saw Moses, not God. It's always about God, not about us. It's always His glory, not our glory. It is always about exalting who he is and making sure that people around us know that he is holy. They failed to do that. The people saw Moses and not God. And because of that also, the typology that is given here is broken. 
God says to him, Because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. There's consequence. Quickly. The typology is broken down. Let me just remind us that in the book of Hebrews, repeatedly, notice the verses in Hebrews, chapter 9, 12, 26, 28, 10, 10. Think of 10, 10, especially key, because it is a reminder once again, all of these verses are dealing with that Jesus Christ was offered up once. He was struck how many times? Once. He was crucified once never to be offered up again. And out of him comes living water. You're reminded from Psalm 78. In Psalm 78, it reminds us that the river flowed out of the rock. We're not talking about a little trickle here. We're talking about water flowing out of this rock that was enough so it could, it could water two million people and all their cattle. And God says... Won't you come to me? Remember what he said to the woman at the well? I am living water. Remember he says, drink of this water and you're going to thirst again. But if you drink of the water that I give, you'll never thirst. You'll never thirst for purpose. You'll never thirst for meaning. You'll never thirst for eternal life. You'll never thirst for hope beyond this life. It is given that in this life, there are thirsty people. They desire to know. They desire to have the answers. They desire to have confidence that if they were to die today, they would not go to a place of torment, but that they would go to a place of rest. The answer is in Jesus Christ. The typology is broken down. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. I don't have time to turn to all these. First, chapter 10 verse 4 reminds us. The rock that followed them was Christ. Christ was that rock. And that's why it was so important that Moses only spoke to the rock because he had already struck the rock before. And he needed to simply speak. And in that, God would be glorified. In that, it would be exalted. Some of the verses I just mentioned. Who is the living water? It's Jesus Christ. He would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this water is going to be thirsty. Will become in him a fountain of water, springing up to eternal life, overflowing a river. Notice what it says in chapter 7. If any, the one who believes in me as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The idea of rivers is it's unexhaustible. It doesn't quit. But remember, there's consequence. There is consequence when we fail to stay in our lane. And Moses was reaping that consequence. The Apostle Paul says it this way. The Apostle Paul talks about consequence and failure to stay in our lane. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, I beat my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself would be disqualified. Holiness is the key. Living and staying in the lane that God has given for you. When you look at each of these passages, we are reminded that there's consequence when we fail to stay in our lane. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, if the things of this life I pursue after being a follower of Jesus Christ, and all it produces is wood, hay, and stubble, it's all going to be burned. It's going to be lost. On the other hand, if I do it for the Lord, if I stay in my lane, there's gold, silver, and precious stone. Remember that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where we were this morning, we're reminded to judge ourselves correctly. And because some of the Corinthians didn't judge themselves correctly, some of them even died, even though they were believers. Hebrews chapter 12, whom the Lord loves, he what? Disciplines. No testing for the present seems joyous, but afterwards it yields that peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who are exercised by it. 
So remember, stay in your lane and trust in the Lord. You can avoid disqualification. And what a reward is there. Here we have some reminders that God wants us to know so that we learn to stay in our lane, love Him, serve Him, walk with Him all the days of your life. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the illustrations that You have given us in the Old Testament that help us to remember how great You are, how gracious You are, how loving You have demonstrated Yourself to Israel, and how loving You have demonstrated Yourself to us. Thank You, Jesus, for being willing to go to the cross. Oh, Jesus, I pray that You would empower us as a community of believers through the power of Your Holy Spirit, through the ministry of Your Word, to make a real difference in the people's lives that You bring around us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're